My name is Jonathan Arnott. I'm a member of the European Parliament for North East England for the UK Independence Party, UKIP. So I cover an area that goes all the way from Darlington to Berwick on Tweed, and obviously I do my best to represent people in the European Parliament. If you look at the votes, uh, there are three members of the European Parliament that cover North East England. Now, I got the second seat of the three, and Labour got, uh, Labour got the third seat. Now, that third seat, the Conservatives, were about 3,500 votes across the whole of the North East, away from taking. So, it really was Labour got their second seat before the Conservatives did. I think, really, it's, it's more the Lib Dem seat that I took than the Conservative one. Well, I think it's about, first of all, being aware and being critical of what's going on there. You know, you look at the voting record of the Labour MEPs and everything that's coming through, they seem to rubber stamp. There's so many times when I look at what's going on in the Parliament and, uh, and you know, for example, on the budget, we put through 46 different amendments, uh, uh, myself together with, with some, of the, uh, some of the Italians, to save people money. And I looked across at the Labour side of the chamber and they voted against or abstained, I think, every single time, as far as I could tell. So it's, it's about actually holding the European Union to account and saying, no, there's things that are, that are completely wrong out here. We're prepared to blow the whistle. We're prepared to stand up to it. It's been a real whirlwind. You know, I couldn't have expected it. I've been shocked by some of the things that I've seen. You know, the EU uh, is paying subsidies to bullfighting, for instance. And we worked hard and tried to get the Parliament to vote uh, for that to end. And the Parliament voted by a simple majority for that to end. And we thought, great, job done. But then we were told, no, you have to have at least 60% of MEPs vote that way to get the change made. So the majority was there because of the UKIP MEPs, but it didn't actually happen. I've seen the Parliament completely ignore its own rules time and time again. So the way that things are done out there, you know, you expect a Parliament to, uh, to have certain principles of fairness. And sadly, that is just so, so badly lacking in the European Parliament. What we're trying to do is stop things that, um, that are a problem. And, and, and yes, I mean, the problem is that when, in the UK, the UKIP was the largest party uh, that was sent to Brussels. So voters in the UK clearly want something doing about the, uh, about the mon monstrosity, the waste of money that we've got out in, out in Brussels. The problem is that although there are parties that we can work together with uh, across Europe, see it as this. Um, if you have a £10 Marks and Spencers voucher, you can spend that £10 at Marks and Spencers. You can't spend it anywhere else. What you wouldn't do is pay £20 to get that £10 Marks and Spencers voucher. So, of course, all this EU funding, we're paying twice over in our taxes in membership fees to the European Union. So when that money comes back, in part, to then argue somehow that um, that 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 is the EU giving us something, that this wonderful benevolent EU giving us some of our own money back, I think is, is quite a false argument. But it's one that we hear time and time again in British politics, sadly. Now, how is UKIP going to try and cut through that argument? Well, uh, by simply pointing out the truth, that we are handing over, in cash, £55 million pounds every single day to the European Union, and if they give us some of that money back with strings attached, that is not a good deal for Britain. When they ask us for another £1.7 billion pounds, and Cameron says, I'll pay it, I've halved the bill because we're going to get some of the money back. You know, the bill hasn't been halved. We've just, uh, we've just got the same deal that we always have, which is that we hand over large amounts of money to the EU and some of it comes back. 
People have said, are UKIP aren't going anywhere. For t time and time again we've heard this, election after election. Oh, you've done well at European elections, you won't be able to sustain it to a general election. Then we heard that, uh, that UKIP only do well at European elections, so we started taking seats in large numbers at council elections. We started uh, beating the Lib Dems across the country at council elections. And they said, oh, well, it's just a flash in the pan, it's going to stop. So we did it again the next year. It was still a flash in the pan, apparently. At parliamentary by-elections, we've been coming second time and time again, and, and we've been taking more votes than any other party, just we've not quite got, the hur got past the hurdle of winning under first past the post. So, although across all of those elections, we were doing very, very well indeed, um, the, you know, in each of them, someone else had just pipped us. So, I think what people were starting to, starting to think was, can UKIP actually win a seat under first past the post? And what you normally find is when people believe that you can do something, then they're prepared to vote with their conscience rather than vote tactically. So now people believe that UKIP can take seats at Westminster, I think that opens the potential for many, many more to come. I knocked on doors in Carswell's constituency, of course, and, and, and it was very interesting because there were some people, it's true, some people voted for Carswell because Carswell believes in uh, in genuine democracy, just like UKIP does, and, and people like that, people warm to, uh, to, to Carswell's style. There were other people who voted purely because they were voting UKIP. But the main, the main number, what I saw certainly, the biggest part of Carswell's vote there was the people who were desperately worried about having to choose between voting for Douglas Carswell or voting for UKIP. And they were delighted that Carswell had come across to UKIP because now they were able to vote for both at the same time. So I, I think people support, people support the party, but people also support the principles that both Carswell and UKIP stand for. I, I don't like to make long-term predictions, but you know in the next six months politics is going, to, uh, is, is going to change quite a lot. What I will say is that UKIP have become the main challengers to Labour across the northeast of England, I think. Um, you see the European elections where where UKIP got more votes than Conservatives, Lib Dems, Greens and all the other assorted minor parties put together. So we've got to a point where I think Labour has really treated the electorate in the North East with, uh, with a little bit of disdain. They've just assumed that they're going to win these seats year in, year out, election in, election out, and they haven't done anything really um, to engage with people. Now, when UKIP comes along in these rock-solid, safe Labour seats, and we start putting effort in, then we see that very quickly a lot of people come across to us. So I think the dynamic, the idea that Labour has these heartlands that are completely safe for decades to come, is something that we're, that we're challenging.